and I am here today as usual on Wednesday to uh, answer your questions, to discuss random topics, and to share some Stonemaier Games news. Today I started out with uh, posting a teaser image on Instagram, Stonemaier Games Discord, and the Stonemaier Games Facebook channel, uh, Facebook page. Because, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is that originally I was planning to post our monthly e-newsletter today and have our kind of 10th anniversary celebration start today. But some of the products that I hint at in this teaser image haven't quite arrived yet. And so I, I, we're, we're waiting a little bit. We're stalling a week um, so that uh, if you are interested in any of these products and you order them, then you can get a, you know, you can get the shipment soon afterward rather than waiting for a while. We like to wait until things actually arrive before we sell them. So, but today I wanted to hint at some of those things. And so I posted a teaser image. I'm not going to spoil anything in that image unless I've already spoiled it. There are a few pieces of that puzzle that I have already spoiled. But uh, feel free to take a look at that image on either Instagram, Discord, or um, or the, the Facebook page. It's here. It's a, there's another post on this very Facebook page. Uh, let's see. Carlos has, a, has an early question. He says, let's say hypothetically that a board game company is going to celebrate a big anniversary soon. Okay, hypothetically, do you think that such a company might have developed a secret game to be launched at the anniversary celebration? I'm asking for a friend. I didn't realize I was walking into a spoiler question here, Carlos. Um, spec you guys are welcome to speculate. Are you? Anyone is welcome to speculate about the things I posted in that image. The only two things that I've actually revealed so far are that we have... Uh, and this is just reveals. I haven't said necessarily that we're, we're selling these yet, but I have revealed two upcoming um, promo packs for Rolling Realm. So the Honey Buzz or the Honey Buzz and the Feast for Odin Realm are things that I have revealed already um, that I should do at, at least full reveals of next week. And you'll see if I decide to sell them <laughs> starting next week on our web store. I'm very excited about doing that next week. Chocolate of the day. What are you all indulging in today? Uh, I think my chocolate of the day, I went to Whole Foods the other day and picked up these malted milk chocolate peanut balls that are really, really delicious. Try not to eat too many of them on any given day because they are really, really tasty. But uh, yeah, I'm looking over here at my, my chocolate stash over there. There's Walter down below too. Hey, Walter, you want to say hi? No, he's got stuff to do. Um, but I do have some special chocolate hopefully to eat a little bit later today. What are you indulging in today, if anything? It's also okay if you have better self-control and aren't indulging in anything. Um, my Sunday video this past week was about heist games and heist movies. Heists are one of my favorite themes in fiction, especially in movies, somewhat in TV shows, although I like the condensed form of heist in a, t in a, in a TV show, in a movie, not in a TV show. And I like heist fiction in novels. Uh, but I, so I did a top 10 list of my fav, top 10 favorite heist games, and I also did a, a quick top 10 list of my favorite heist movies, top 10 list there. So feel free to check that out if, if you love the heist theme in general, in fiction or in games. Corey popped in to say he recently did an interview with Sean Fletcher, the senior game designer at The Op, on his page. He designed... Uh, Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances and helped Paul Peterson on Smash Up Marvel and Disney. When I asked him what other publishers excite, excited him, his first choice was Stonemaier Games. That's awesome. And he spoke very highly of you in the company. Skip to 37, 15. So uh, if, if you're listening to this, Corey um, posted a link to an interview that he did. Thank you, Corey, for sharing that. I am flattered that Sean would say that. Um, that means a lot to me that, that a fellow designer uh, would say that about some of our games. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Bernardo says um, uh, something. He says something nice. So happy to hear your company is almost ten. Well deserved. Thank you. Uh, he says if you ever release more puzzles, I think a great reviewer can be Karen Cavett, aka Karen Puzzles. I don't know if, know if you've ever watched her content. You know, we haven't sent out any review copies of the puzzle. I would be happy to do that for someone who specializes in puzzles. Um, I, yeah, I don't know who that. I, I, I I'm not uh, in tune with the with the puzzle market. Is this a YouTuber? I'll, I'll look on YouTube real quick. Karen Puzzles. Yeah, it does look like Karen Puzzles is a reviewer on YouTube. Um, I, I'll reach out to her and see if uh, if that's something that she might be interested in checking out. Definitely a little bit out of our wheelhouse, but why not? You know, why not? Thank you for for that information about that. I appreciate that. 
Michael recommends Money Heist. And yeah, Money Heist was actually what I what I thought about when I when I was thinking about um, a TV version of a heist. I tried to watch Money Heist. I watched a few episodes, but it it seemed to follow that kind of TV format where they where they drag it out a little bit. Um, and maybe that's part of the point. Like if TV de definitely gives you that flexibility of, of stretching things out a little bit, telling more specific stories, getting deeper into the characters. Um, but I, I found that I kind of just wanted everything to start happening. I, I wanted it to wrap up. And so I, I, I only got maybe three episodes in, didn't go any deeper. Maybe I should have. Maybe there's a, is there a certain season of Money Haste that's really, really good? Maybe the first wasn't that season. Right now, some shows that we're watching. So far, I've watched both episodes of House of the Dragon, the new Game of Thrones show. And I must admit that I thought the second episode was fantastic. It uh, it, it wasn't... It, it The first episode was kind of over the top. I, I enjoyed it, but it was it was over the top gory. It was over the top in, in several other ways. But the second episode was a lot more subtle, a lot more kind of... Um, I don't even necessarily want to say political maneuvering, but um, person to person maneuvering and, and and just a lot of good dialogue and people trying to get what they want or people trying to figure out what they want. And I thought it was fantastic. I, I thought it was really, really good. So I don't know if you're, I, I know some people maybe uh, were burnt out on Game of Thrones, um, but I the second episode I thought exemplified the best parts of Game of Thrones in my opinion. And I would highly recommend at least checking it out so far if, if you were ever interested in Game of Thrones. We're also watching She-Hulk week to week. We're finishing up the season season 14 of American Ninja Warrior. Um, we're watching a show uh, as our lunchtime comedy, a show called Uncoupled. That's very good so far. And I'm getting excited about Andor and the new um, Lord of the Rings show. In fact, I wanted to check, when does, when does Andor premiere? Does anyone know? Is that today or is it... In a few days, I thought it was early September, but Disney usually premieres shows on on Wednesdays. Let me know about that. About that, that's the new Star Wars show that's coming out soon. Uh, Chad says, without spoilers in the comments, has anyone come close to what the game is in the center of the tease? That would be a bit of a spoiler. I, I yeah, that I, I don't want to confirm or deny that, Chad, but I, I welcome speculation about the things that I've revealed, um, sneak peeks of in that image. So Cynthia also recommends Money Heist. I generally appreciate Cynthia's recommendations. Um, again, Cynthia, I, mean, I think I'm commenting a little bit behind here, but I, I did watch the first few episodes and didn't uh, didn't you know didn't it didn't tug me in enough to keep on going. So maybe I need to give it another shot. Travis says for Scythe, is there any concern with having more resources than the base game comes with? Uh, so I think, Travis, what you're asking is, do you need more resources than what the game includes? And uh, I, I have never run into that. Um, I've never run into that issue. I, I think resources are generally generally spent uh, soon enough that even in larger group player games, that that is never an issue. But I think we do uh, include some multipliers on the punch boards if you really, really run out of resources and need them. So thanks to the multipliers, multipliers you should definitely never run out of resources. So, and that goes for the, the wooden resources included in the game and the realistic resources that we sell separately. Yeah. Dan says he really enjoyed my heist list. Thank you, Dan. He says, I love that theme too. There was a great UK series called Hustle, which was basically a self-contained heist film every week. I'm sure you would love it. Ooh, I would love that. I, I like that. I, you know, I really, that, really like the idea of, a, uh, of it being self-contained and, and not uh, stretching out over multiple episodes. Um, so I will make a note of that, Dan. I don't know if Hustle is available here. I know there was a movie that came out called Hustle a few years ago. Actually, no, very recently. It came out this year. I think it has Adam Sandler in it. But I'll check that out. Thank you for the recommendation. Trevor says, Logan uh, Gianni is also a big puzzle guru. Let's see who that is. Actually, I already closed the tab that I needed to save for before. There we go. Karen Puzzles. I'll contact Karen Puzzles in a bit. Let's see who this other person is. Logan. Who is Logan? I don't see him on I, I don't see him on YouTube, but there are other formats, of course. Let me know where you find this Logan guy, Trevor. Darren says, have you tried Brazil Imperium? I played it twice, lovely game, but it won't replace my favorite game of all time, Scythe. Darren, you know, I am pretty sure that Brazil Imperium was submitted to us around three or four years ago. Maybe four or five years ago. It was a while ago. I am 
pretty sure because I remember a Brazil themed game that somewhat resembled Psy, maybe somewhat resembled Terra Mystica. And uh, even the prototype graphic design, I remember it because it was a really beautiful game on the tabletop, but, um, but it didn't intrigue us enough to pursue it. Uh, and so we didn't, we didn't pursue it. I'm pretty sure that is this game. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Also, things change a lot uh, after, after, you know, from prototype to final publishing. So I think I have played an early version of this game and decided it wasn't something that at least that we wanted to publish, but there are plenty of games that we don't publish that I still enjoy. So I need to, I need to play the published version and see if I enjoy it. I am really excited, hopefully at game night tonight, to play my new copy of Castle, The Castles of Madkin Ludwig. I received my collector's edition copy um, just a couple days ago. I unboxed it. Put it all together, got the tiles all out. Lots of punching tiles in this game. This is one of my favorite games that I haven't played in a few years because I was waiting for this special copy to arrive from Kickstarter. I was a Kickstarter backer, and I'm so excited. I'm, I'm really hoping we get to the table tonight. I understand if we don't, but I am very excited to play it again. Patty says that she also loved the second episode of House of the Dragon. Uh, Chad says one of his favorite heist games is Star Wars Outer Rim. I know you haven't played it yet. I still haven't played that one, and I, I don't want to hype it too much, but it definitely feel has the heist feels. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I need to get that one to the table. I love the Star Wars theme. Um, now that you're selling it as a heist game, I'm, I'm even more intrigued by it. So I definitely need to get that to the table. I'm trying to see, I'm looking through my notes here to see if there's anything really urgent. I think a lot of the stuff today is just kind of fun topics. Actually, one big topic I did want to mention is that the science, if you're in St. Louis, the Science Center here in St. Louis is hosting a gaming themed event. It's named after Magic the Gathering, but uh, they actually will have places for a bunch of different publishers to share their games at this event. We have two volunteers, uh, Michael and Brandon, and maybe Lydia, if Lydia is available, who will be kind of manning a few tables and showing some of our games to people who attend this event. But if you're in St. Louis, and I think it's probably a little more geared towards families and kids, but if you are, if you, that falls, if that sounds like you and you're interested in going to this event, some of our games will be at the Science Center this Friday. The details are on the St. Louis Science Center's Facebook page. Um, I believe it's around six o'clock at night, maybe a little bit later, around that time. But yeah, if you're in St. Louis, feel free to check that out and you can learn how to play several, several of our games because Brandon and Michael are going to be there helping to teach some of those games. Justin says, can you see Stonemaier ever making a sports-themed game? Would love to see how Stonemaier would tackle baseball. Justin, I have an older video, a couple, maybe five years ago now, about why I think sports-themed games generally don't work. And I, the overarching reason I, I explained for that, or I mentioned for that, is that I think anyone, or many people who love a sport enough to want to play it... Um, would rather actually play the sport, some version of the sport, definitely not professionally probably for most people, but casually at least, um, then play a game that is trying to simulate that sport. There are definitely exceptions to that. There are popular sporting games that are exceptions to that rule, but I think that is generally, um, I think that is generally the case and it's definitely the case for me. So I think it's highly unlikely that we will ever publish a sports themed game. I think the one possible exception to that, or the, the general exception to that are racing games. I'm someone who doesn't care about racing in real life at all. I don't follow any car racing. Um, I'm trying to think of any sports. I guess I follow sprinting. I like, I like sprinting, I like the 100-yard 100, 100 dash. But uh, I think racing games do translate well into tabletop games. I don't know exactly why that's the exception. Um, maybe it's because... Actually, I, I have no idea. It, maybe it's one of those things that a lot of people follow and are interested in but can't actually go out and do. Like, no one... Few people can actually go race a car around the track uh, because we don't have access to that. But yeah, so Justin, I think it's highly unlikely with the one exception maybe being a racing game. Okay, Michael says I should give Money Heist another chance. So I did, Michael says give it a chance. I did give it a chance. I mean, I gave it at least three episodes and it, it really seemed to, I don't want to knock on honey, Money Heist, but I think a lot of TV shows of that style, heist or otherwise, follow a trope where they stretch things out a lot and then lead up to a cliffhanger. And then at the beginning of the next episode, they, they show you, oh, the, cliff, the cliffhanger actually wasn't that bad. Everything's okay. And they do that again and again and again. I think the show Prison Break did that over and over and over again. And uh, I kind of got tired of it. So 
that trope in TV shows doesn't work for me. Um, but I don't know. I'll, I, many of you are recommending this show. Clearly, you like it. I like high shows, so maybe I'll give Money Heist another try. I think Megan has even watched a few seasons of it, so I'll, I'll talk to her about maybe revisiting it um, down to a few episodes. Michael also says there's an Asian version of Money Heist condensed to six episodes, which is tight. Six episodes is a, is a tight time frame to, to tell a story. I, I do appreciate that, especially if there's... That, that indicates that they're not stretching it out too much, at least. Cher, uh, Cherry says that Lord of the Rings is this weekend. Awesome. And Andrew says Andor is later in September, uh, but it's premiering with three episodes out of the gate. Ooh, that's exciting. September 21st. Let me make sure I have that in my calendar. September 21st for Andor. Yeah, okay. I have that on my calendar. Should have known that. Uh, thank you all for, for letting me know, know that. Glad I'm, I didn't get too excited about it today. Um... I think we're probably going to start watching the new season of Westworld. We're a little behind on that. And we're also a little behind on um, For All Mankind. I think I don't think we've watched any of the most recent season, but I really, I've really enjoyed that alternate history show so far. In fact, I'm really excited. I don't know if you all have been paying attention to this, but um, NASA is trying to get back to the moon, uh, starting with an unmanned rocket uh, unmanned vessel that tried to launch earlier this week and didn't and so they're going to try again i believe on friday or saturday that's pretty cool i didn't realize how soon that was happening that they were trying to do that starting with an unmanned vessel and then a manned vessel uh with uh, several women i think on it uh, not not men at all um going up in a few years which is awesome i i that's really cool i, lo I love that kind of stuff Tony says, a few weeks ago, a few weeks back, some of us mentioned Station Eleven as a show you might like. Wonder if you ever checked it out. Uh, Tony, I wrote a blog post about it. I did. We watched maybe half the season of Station Eleven, and it uh, it didn't it didn't hook us to keep watching. I thought it was interesting, um, but we got we were more excited by other shows. We might return to it someday. My blog post was about the costume design, which is not something I normally notice in shows, but I thought the costume design in the show was brilliant. If you haven't watched it, Station Eleven is kind of a, a post-apocalyptic show, and people make the oddest clothing when they don't have anyone else making the clothing for them anymore. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend checking out the costume design if, if you're interested in that sort of thing from uh, Station Eleven. Tommy says, is there an idea or a mechanism that you wanted inside but didn't make the cut? I think everything that I wanted inside, everything that was working, that I was excited about, ended up making the cut. Scythe did start off as a very different game. It was, it started off, the original concept was a game where each player would have their own asymmetric deck of cards. It was a card-driven game where each card corresponded to a specific character or mech or animal that uh, was on the board, that had either a, a standee or a miniature on the board itself. And so you had this deck of cards that corresponded to those things. Maybe a little bit like the game uh, that came out more recently. I, play, I think Uncharted is the game where you have, where each card corresponds to a specific token on the board. Um, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go that route. I, I didn't figure out a way to get it to work. Um, but uh, the, the key that I wanted to, to, to look for there was I wanted players to, uh, and I think this is what Uncharted does, I, I wanted characters to feel a psychological connection between their units and the things they were doing turn to turn. I, di I didn't want that abstracted. Um, so in the final version of Side, that is much more abstracted. Like the worker meeples, you don't know their names, for example. You don't know who they are. You don't know who these people are that you're asking to do things. But I did incorporate that idea of popularity. So you hopefully feel a little bit for the workers when you when you you know when you push your opponent's workers out of a territory uh on some abstract level you are thinking of them as people that you're pushing off their land and that's why you're losing popularity for doing so yeah long answer to a question that yeah didn't exactly apply here to size but I'm, I'm happy to talk about origin stories for our games and things that changed over time if i can remember it oh uh, speaking of memory uh I did, uh, I tried 23andMe, which is a genetic testing service uh, to learn more about my ancestry and to learn more about uh, any, anything I should be aware of for my, my kind of genetic health, I guess. And the reason that came to mind is apparently the one bad thing that came up, I, some interesting things came up that I'll share in a second, but the one bad thing that came up is apparently I have two of the markers, two out of the four markers that are seen in people who 
often end up having late onset Alzheimer's. And I'm hoping my gaming hobby and my gaming career will keep my brain active so that doesn't end up being uh, an issue with, with, with my brain and my, my body in the future. Uh, but it's, I'm glad that I know that now. I, I, that wasn't something that I had on my radar, something I should be worried about. I also found out that I'm 84% more Neanderthal than most people. And all right, now, is that right? No, I'm, I'm more Neanderthal than 84% of people. And I also realized that I don't have any German in me. I thought I did, uh, but at least from the results revealed so far, I am primarily British and uh, British and Irish and Polish. Polish was like 20%, mostly British and Irish. And that also, my ancestors go way back to the Middle East and Northern Africa. I have some Ashkenazi Jew in me. I have some uh, Iranian in me and a little bit of Northern Africa. Just a tiny little bit. Um, but yeah, it was fascinating to, to go through that process and see. And apparently, like, the results continue to emerge over time as they, as uh, 23me and other services like that gather more data from other people. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I wrote a blog post about it yesterday on my personal blog. Frank clarified that first Friday, uh, this Friday, the Gaming Friday at the Science Center starts at 5 o'clock, not 6 o'clock when I said, like I said, thank you, Frank, for clarifying that. Corey says, have I tried Luna Capital from Devere Games? Um, I tried a few games from Devere, but not Luna Capital. He says, I'm supposed to get my copy this week, and the playthroughs that I've watched seem like it's going to be a solid game. Set drafting uh, and tableau building. I have not played it, but that does sound interesting. I was reminded the other day of how much I enjoy drafting through, not gaming, but through, um, I guess, uh, disc golf. In disc golf, there's a big tournament happening. The, the world tur World's Tournament is happening. And a few of my disc golfing friends said that they uh, decided to create a little draft pool where we would draft players for men, for women, and root for those players throughout the tournament. And we put a tiny little bit of money on the line, $10 each, just for fun. Um, but it's been, the tournament started yesterday, and I remember during this process of how much I love drafting. I love drafting games. I love drafting for fantasy baseball. I, I want to draft more things now that I did this. Um, and so we might do that more often in the disc golf in the future. But the other part of it is if you are not into disc golf or not into watching disc golf, Worlds is like a, a great tournament to get into it. It lasts five days. There's a lot of drama. There's a lot of back and forth players who have great days and not so great days. And uh, so I would highly recommend checking it out. And if you're into disc golf, you probably already know about it, but I would highly also recommend checking out the coverage. You can either check out like full coverage on a YouTube channel called Jomez Pro and GK Pro. That's for women and men respectively. Or you can go to the, um, the Disc Golf Pro Tour YouTube channel and just watch the day's highlights in like, it, usually they're around six to 10 minutes. So it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, Ricardo says, we literally can't stop playing Ankh by Eric Lang, and I'd like to know if you tried it and if you guys ever talked about some sort of collaboration. I think Eric's, uh, Eric's style of, uh, doing a lot of things is very different than the way that I do things. Um, so I don't know if we'd work very well together. Um, I do respect him as a, as a designer. I have played Ankh, and, uh, I thought it was fine. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I haven't returned to it in, since my first play and probably won't. I'm trying to think of... If I have a favorite Eric Lane game, it's probably Blood Rage. Um, although I did like, yeah, probably Blood Rage. Blood Rage is probably the one that I'm most likely to play repeatedly. But I feel like I did learn a lot from playing uh, Cthulhu Death May Die. I think he and Rob Davio did some really clever things in that game. But Blood Rage is probably the game of his that I'm most likely to play again and have played multiple times already. Simon says, do negative reviews of your games affect you in any way and how do you deal with it? So, I mean, I'm cer like certainly negativity around my games definitely uh, it impacts me. Like I, I put a lot of passion into the games that I design and also the games that I develop and publish, um, even if I'm not the designer. I will say, though, that I don't actually, at least for like professional reviewers, I don't consume those reviews um, specifically because I want to remain as unbiased as possible when I send out review copies. So I know on a human level that if I knew that reviewer A really didn't like a number of our games uh, and spoke very negatively of them. Um, I think on a human level, I would be less likely to send that reviewer another game. However, I don't want to do that. I, I want our reviews or I want reviews of our games to be as unbiased as possible so that you, the point of those reviews is so that you, the consumer, can get an, um, can get an unbiased opinion about those games. So 
I want our reviews to go to a wide variety of people who like or dislike our games. So I don't, long story short, I don't consume reviews of our games. And so I don't actually even know if there is a negative review about one of our games. Um, and I don't want to know. I, I, I really want to remain unbiased there. The, uh, I, I do see what people say about our games. I see it on Board Game Geek. I see it elsewhere as well. And so it certainly gives me a little boost when I see someone enjoyed one of our games, because that's why we make our games, because we want to bring joy to people. And it definitely stings a little bit when I see someone who really doesn't like one of our games. But um, oftentimes that comes with some constructive feedback, comes with something for me to learn. And so, especially if someone posts something negative, but constructive, something that I can walk away from and I can learn from, um, I appreciate that. And, uh, and that doesn't sting nearly as much. Maybe stings a little bit still, but, but I like that I can, I can learn and grow. And I do get a lot of feedback, a lot of solicited feedback from playtesters, uh, local and blind playtesters. And not all of them, in fact, throughout the process, most people don't, well, I don't want to say most people don't like them, but I will get plenty of negative feedback during the playtest feed process. And because I'm actively asking for feedback, that's when I'm like, my, my psychological door is wide open to that feedback. And I, I like to get that feedback. I want eventually those games to be good and well received by playtesters. But throughout the process, I expect to get negative feedback. I expect there to be things that are frustrating that playtesters don't like. And I want to hear those things so that I can iron them out before I publish the game. Uh, let's see. Logan. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, it looks like someone tagged Logan and Logan actually showed up for this chat here. Logan, I think the, the context is that, um, I, I, I run a game publishing company. My name is Jamie. Nice to meet you. And, uh, we published three jigsaw puzzles for the first time earlier this year. And I think people were posting in the comments about jigsaw puzzle content creators who they really like and admire and your name came up. That's why that's why you were tagged here. So Logan, if you are interested in a review copy of the puzzles that we created for, for Wingspan earlier this year, feel free to let me know. I'm happy to send you some puzzles. Justin says, he says that he thinks management games based around certain sports can be a lot of fun, such as out of the park baseball, um, has you purely acting as a GM and manager. I think that's something board gaming might be able to do. And Justin, maybe there is something there, might, might be something there. And I, like I just said a few minutes ago, I, I love the drafting part, portion of fantasy baseball. I also like, though, that it's attached to, to real baseball being played. So it is possible there's something there. But I think, I think there, are, even from a marketing perspective, there are so few sporting games that have broken through and been successful commercially um, that uh, I, I would be very, very hesitant to take on a sporting game. Maybe, I mean, yeah, yeah, very hesitant. <laughs> George says, how do I feel now at your 10 year Stonemaier Games anniversary? Any reflections or thoughts? Have you stopped for a minute and just thought about anything? He says, hey, I really enjoyed my recent interview with Dusty. Yeah, so Dusty at the Mill had a chat the other day where we talked about Dusty's 200th episode of the Mill and the 10th anniversary of Stonemaier Games. And so that was a time for me to reflect on it a little bit. But no, George, honestly, I haven't really... Um, I haven't really sat down and, and reflected on what the 10 years means because I feel like I have so much more to do and so much to do on a daily basis. Um, perhaps I perhaps I should do that, but I haven't haven't really taken the time to do that. Uh, honestly, I, I, I haven't. Look, uh, well, I have a lot. Of, I, I'll get back to my stuff in a minute. I don't think I have any big... So I, some stuff happening behind the scenes here is that uh, well, next Wednesday will be the, the big reveal, the big Summer Games reveal. Um, Things that I've been working on are more Rolling Realms promos. That's been fun to work on. Some game design, lots of game design time recently, and some proofreading for a game um, that we have in the works or product, a couple of products that we have in the works, really. And uh, yesterday was my filming day, so I did a lot of filming yesterday for various videos. Also, one thing, so because we had originally scheduled our 10th anniversary celebration to start today, we asked Tabletopia to make the one and two player version versions of our games available for free this month. And so I, I think they're going to start that today, where if you want to play around with any of our games on Tabletopia to see how they work, you can play them. You can just get on there solo and play around with it solo or get another player and play, play it with them. Um, those modes, I think, should be available for all of our games for free starting today throughout September. 
I could be wrong about that. They might bump it until next week and next Wednesday, but feel free to check that out. If there's a game of ours that you've been wanting to kind of fiddle around with and see if it looks and feels like a game for you, check out our games on Tabletopia, probably starting today. I think it should be ready today. Suzanne recommends the show Press on Amazon Prime. She says it's a smart mystery set in competing newspapers. Very binge-worthy. Interesting. I haven't heard anything about Press, but I'll, I'll go check that out. Tim is popping in to say hi today. Hi, Tim. Thanks for dropping by. I know it's hard for Tim to join these days, but I'm, I'm glad to hear from you, Tim. Jerry says, have I seen Robert Redford's Sneaker? Or Sneakers, I think. I remember it being a fun 90s heist movie. It's been a while, but I have seen Sneakers. Yeah. Brian says, with being as busy as you are, do you find yourself with several unplayed games on your shelf? I find myself buying games that interest me, but it's hard to get, to them all to the, get them all to the table. How do you tackle this, or how do you find yourself selling off or getting rid of unplayed games? Yeah, a couple different uh, elements there, Brian. I do have a shelf of opportunity. It's right over there. Um, right now, there are about 12 games on it. Um, 12 games on the to shelf of opportunity. Uh, I... I I'm fairly discerning in the games that I buy, so I, I typically only buy games that I think I will definitely play, that I want to play. And for that reason, I also exceedingly rarely accept free games. There are people who reach out to me and ask to give me a game, but uh, I've been getting, I've gotten a lot more discerning about that because I don't want to accept a game that I don't actually want to play or that I don't think I'll play. So I have very few games on that shelf. I get through them, I think, because... Uh, my, my girlfriend loves games, so we play games together. I have a friend who is willing to learn games and teach them on an ongoing basis. So every pretty much every week, I, I have a, a time set aside to play games with Henry. Um, I host a weekly game night. I have another friend who hosts a weekly game night. And uh, so I have lots of opportunities to play games. Now, many times, I just want to play something that I already know how to play. Or I want to play something that a friend is excited about. That's maybe new, new to me, but they, it's not new to them. And so I, I play a lot of different games all the time. I don't always get through the games on my shelf, but it does help. Henry helps a lot. Um, Henry uh, is willing to, to learn the games and, and teach them and, and play them with me. And so that's one of the major reasons I've been able to get through that. So find a friend who, who really enjoys learning games and, and playing new games with you. That might be a way to get through that shelf, uh, shelf opportunity a little bit. In terms of games that I give away, I try to keep, I'm looking over at my shelf over here. I try to keep games off the top of my shelf. So if I can keep the top of my shelf clean, um, I'm good. If I start to see games pile up there, then I give them away. I start by trying to give them away locally to friends. And if that doesn't work, then I try to give them away to, um, to organizations that will accept them. Oftentimes this means uh, like board game clubs at schools. They, they often want games. Um, uh, Corey, Corey's in the chat here. Corey is associated with an, associ uh, an organization for um, for juveniles who who need a place to go, need need support, and so they have a gaming center there. So I'm lo always looking for those opportunities to find ways to just give away the games. I, I don't seek to sell any of the games that I'm no longer playing. I just I want to give them to someone who is eager to to give them a try. Frank says, I think racing as a theme, this is Frank from uh, the Isle of, Isle of uh, City of Games. Frank says, personally, I think racing as a theme works well as the idea of trying to, to get somewhere fast moves outside of sport. That's really well said, Frank. It's something many of us do on a daily basis and can relate to without needing to be a fan of a specific sport. Beautifully said there, Frank. Uh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think that summarizes it really, really well. Tim says he's enjoying House of the Dragons as well and Stranger Things. We watched Stranger Things earlier this summer, and he just picked up Radlands. Great two-player game. I did actually just played a fantastic two-player game a couple days ago called Jekyll vs. Hyde. Talked about that on a video on Tuesday. Really, really great two-player trick-taking game with a little bit of a tug-of-war element. Um, and Megan and I played a lot of uh, the, Guild, uh, the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Guilds? Guild? Guild? The Guild of Merchant Explorers. We played that three times over the weekend like we kept wanting to play one more game one more game one more game it is a really really good game or at least i'm really enjoying it and megan seemed to enjoy that as well we also taught uh, my, my friend's son who i filmed a video for a while ago where i was talking about medium weight games with maps and lots of interaction and i got a lot of great recommendations there ethnos is one that i want to show him but i don't have ethnos yet but i wanted to show him rumble nation i think rumble nation is a great game uh, with lots of player, lots of player interaction, but it doesn't overstay its welcome. Players don't feel picked on all that much in that game. Uh, maybe a little bit, but not all that much. Uh, 
it, just a fantastic game. And so I, I shared it with my, my friend Trevor and his son, Will. We played that twice this past weekend, and Megan joined in that game as well. A lot of fun. I highly recommend Rumble Nation if you like that style of game. Tim says, what are some recommendations for games you can f fit in, in your carry-on or in your backpack? For air travel, we were we were returning to Maui this weekend. Maui, fancy trip, Tim. He says, I think Scout Trails and Radlands are some possible options. Rolling Realms doesn't take a whole lot of space as well. Tim, off the top of my head, uh, well, I, I did a list about a video about small box games fairly recently. Let's see if I can find it. I'll find some keywords here. But yeah, search on my channel for, here we go, travel friendly games. So I, I, have, I have two here. I have my top 10 small box games for big gatherings. And so that's one if you're going to meet a bunch of people, look for that list, Tim. I also have a list of my top 10 favorite travel friendly games. That's one that I created thinking in mind uh, games where you're traveling with maybe one specific person, like a gaming partner, and you want games that don't take up a lot of space, both in your backpack and on the tabletop itself, because you might have only access to smaller tabletops. So check out those two videos. I think there are some, some decent recommendations on those videos. Andrew says, did you ever watch Man in the High Castle? And no, I haven't watched it. I do love alternate histories, but I, I never watched that one. I, maybe I need to add that to my, my ongoing list. Thanks for that, that recommendation. Uh, Aramis says, big congrats on our 10th anniversary. There was a poll a while back about a tapestry organizer, an insert versus a big box. He says... I'm selfishly hoping that the insert option led the poll. Any insight that you could share? You are correct that uh, that an insert for the existing tapestry box, which I think is plenty big enough, uh, did lead the poll. And we are working on that now. I haven't revealed anything about that yet, but it is something that we are actively working on. Yeah. Dan says that Hustle was, so Dan recommended a high show called Hustle. He says it was a BBC program and it's on BritBox, which I think is available in the U.S., Cool. Okay. I don't think we have BritBox, but we have like eight other streaming channels. So maybe it's on one of them. Next is I also used to separate sports and board games, but Blood Bowl, Blood Bowl, I think is one of the exceptions that broke through. Does a fantastic job of bridging the gap while also letting folks get into minis painting and 3D printing. Also, Landis says hi and that the second iteration of Ant Kingdoms will be ready soon. Thanks to your recommendation, we checked out Shards of Infinity. So Nick is someone, Nick and his son, um, follow the Beans and Dice podcast, which is a live call-in show every Thursday. And they had a question. I can't remember how the call-in worked, if I was calling in or if you were calling in. But uh, yeah, they had a question during one of those call-in shows. That's really cool. I'm glad he's still working on, on the game. I'm glad your son's working on it. Chad says that discovering your family roots could make a cool tabletop game. It, yeah, that, that could be pretty cool. I could see it working a little bit like, um, like uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name now. What's the, oh, Beyond Beyond the Sun, the, the, the tech tree game that came out a few years ago, really excellent tech tree game, the, having the family tree build out like that. Zach says, do I have any large changes in the tapestry design? No, no large changes. We're just kind of tweaking a few of the civilizations. Um, that's the, the civ adjustment process that we're going through right now so we can publish like final versions of the sieves. I have a point where we say, okay, we're not making any other adjustments after this. Here are the sieves, here are printed versions of them. So we're working on that right now. I think most of them are pretty small adjustments, but they are bigger than the original adjustments that were just like gain an extra resource or don't gain an extra resource or gain some extra points. We're doing a little bit more than that since we are actually reprinting a few of the civilizations. Ivan says there's a plant that grows here that we call bear claw that re rejuvenates the brain and protects from serious conditions. Interesting. I haven't heard of the bear claw, Ivan. Tim says he's looking forward to spending a weekend in St. Louis next month. He still has a gift card from Miniature Market that he needs to use. Always looking for re recommendations as to what to check out next. Tim, I think you might have a link to the, the, the food um, Google Doc that I share. For anyone who visited St. Louis, who, who, who will visit St. Louis, I recommend a lot of food. I have, there's a lot of food here that I really love. And uh, so I have a long list of recommendations uh, if you are visiting. That's, uh, here, I'll, I'll post a link to that Google Doc so you can have it in the comments below. I'm always happy to share this Google Doc for anyone who wants it. Here it goes, St. Louis food recommendations. There we go. Efren says, why didn't I use game trays for the new Viticulture crate? The trays are too flimsy. Efren, I uh, appreciate your, your feedback there. I haven't personally found them too flimsy. I think they hold up pretty well. Um, 
But uh, we have found that working with Panda is the smoothest way for us to iterate and test different game designs. Um, I have a lot of respect for Noah. I, I, I love Noah as a friend here in St. Louis. He's the, the guy who runs game trays. So nothing against game trays at all. I just, I found that I'm really comfortable working directly with Panda on the trays. And I had fun designing the trays. I, I really, I know Viticulture really well. So I really thought through that design process quite a bit. Um, and you should cl clarify here, game trays doesn't actually print trays anymore. They outsource to, manu to manufacturers. So they design, but it's up to the publisher to design to figure out how thick they want the plastic to be. So that isn't a game trays thing. That's us determining how thick we need the plastic to be um, to, for a tray to be durable and functional. And I think we accomplished that goal for Viticulture World. Um, I'm sorry they're too flimsy for you, but uh, hopefully they're still functional. The point of them is to be functional, and I think they are. Alex Goldsmith has the first mention of baseball highlights, 2045. Yeah, that is one of the, the other breakthrough sports-themed games, Alex. I'm glad you got the first mention in today. Chris says, good morning from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, where Kelly's Country Creamery ice cream is, the, the, is was one of the most talked about suggestions when I asked for ice cream recommendations across the U.S. recently, or across the world, really. I'll eat ice cream anywhere. He says he's most likely moving from Wisconsin to Arizona soon. Do you have any recommendations for how to pack his game so the boxes and content don't get damaged? I may need to put some in storage too. Uh, pack them tightly? I don't know. I, I would get uh, I pack them as tightly as possible. If you can, I don't know if you have this option, but if you do have any local um, fulfillment centers or publishers who have their own warehouses, oftentimes the games that we get in, the, in cartons, those cartons are really, really designed very thickly and, and sturdily to support games. So this is like when we get a new shipment of Wingspan, six copies of Wingspan come in a carton. Uh, that carton is very, very sturdy. So if you have a way of getting gaming cartons, um, that could be a great way to have a, a very secure way to transport your games around. Yeah. Tim says, are we doing a charity auction this year? And we are. That's a great question, Tim. Yeah, we are. And we're planning to start it on October 5th. Uh, we already have the content creators picked out. Um, they're on board for it. We have the, the items picked out that we're going to be showcasing for it. I'm, I'm really excited about that in early October. Melissa says that she's really been enjoying the Gilda Merchant Explorers too. Yeah, I, it, it caught me off guard. I, I, I knew nothing about it. I, I should trust AEG by now to make great games, but I really enjoy the simultaneous play and the special powers. I love the special powers in the game. It makes every game feel really exciting, whether we're using the same map or, uh, or a different map from the previous game. Mike popped in very kindly from Peach State Hobby to wish us a happy 10 years of Stonemaier Games. Thank you, Mike. I, I really appreciate you saying that. Tim says, have I played any of the Tiny Epic games? He says, I have Tiny Epic, tiny epic Dinosaurs looking for things that have weight but take up less space. I have played some Tiny Epic games. I think the, the one that I would be excited to play again someday is Tiny Epic Galaxies. That's the one of maybe the four or five that I've played that, that I'd be excited to play again. Michael says he taught Rolling Realms to the owner of a local store here in the Philippines during their event last weekend. Thank you for teaching that, Michael. I appreciate that. He says they had a blast and even played an extra round after playing a full game, 12 Realms in total. That's awesome. That's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing that game with others. Um, yeah, I, I'm always, I always really, really appreciate when anyone teaches our games. Uh, Travis says, I just discovered Crokinole. Are you a fan? Absolutely. Yeah, Crokinole is actually at the top of my list of uh, games that I recommend if you love disc golf, or if you love Crokinole, I would also recommend playing disc golf. Crokinole is essentially a, uh, a different a different rules, but it has the feel of disc golf on the tabletop. I have a couple friends that have have Crokinole. I don't, I don't have a copy of myself, but um, yeah, I, I love Crokinole. I think it works for gamers and non-gamers non -gamers alike. It works for quick little short games if you want to do that, if you want to just say, okay, we're going to play this for a few minutes and stop. It also works if you want to play a full game. Yeah, great game. Tim says, what do I think of the new cost-reduced streamlined Spirit Island from Target? I haven't actually played it yet. Um, the whole concept, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it, as long as uh, it still meets the needs of, of people who want to try to play a game. Um, but I haven't, I haven't actually played it yet, Tim, so I can't comment on it yet. Nick says, any plans on expanding the Red Rising universe beyond the current card game? Would love to see a scythe-style game in the, Rolling Real, or the Red Rising world. Um, we are waiting to read book six, Nick. Um, the, the author has announced that there will be a book six and a book seven. We're probably going to make a decision after book six as to how to proceed. If we're going to do like a sequel, a spinoff, 
uh, an expansion or nothing at all, or just promos, we don't really know. But uh, let me know what you mean by a scythe-like type of game. Uh, I think people view scythe in different ways. So let me know. So scythe to me is an engine builder with a, with a map on, on the board. So is that what you're looking for in in uh, Red Rising? And that is something that I tried to design originally for Red Rising and ended up uh, not really liking what came out of those early designs. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. But yeah, let me know what about scythe you are looking for in a in a Red Rising game. Jason says, you mentioned in your interview with Dusty of the Mill that there was something you tried with stretch goals for the original Scythe Kickstarter that was a mistake and perhaps pushed some people away from the campaign. Can you talk about what you tried and why you think it didn't work? So Jason, yeah, I was trying to remember during that conversation what exactly happened. Um, what I think I, I tried to do was essentially a daily stretch goal uh, method where at the beginning of the project, I didn't reveal any stretch goals or maybe very few. And I, the idea was that every day I would reveal a new goal for that day based on how we did the previous day. So if, um, if we, so to say we started the day at 300,000 and I, I might set that day's goal at $350,000. Um, and after we reached that goal, I wouldn't reveal anything else until the next day. And then I would reach, I would base that next goal, next goal's day based on the starting funding level for that day. I mean, I was basically doing what creators do behind the scenes with stretch goals. Stretch goals are a marketing tool. It's a carrot on a stick. They work fairly well, but those numerical funding elements are highly flexible. Uh, once you get up to a certain level, you're really no longer looking at economies of scale. You're making X number of games. If you're making 5,000 plus games, the economies of scale don't really impact it all that much. Um, so it's just kind of a game to play with backers. And I think I thought backers maybe knew what that game was like. And, it, and I realized the backers just wanted to kind of play the game as usual and not think about it. And so what I ended up doing is just uh, after I think two days, I said, okay, this isn't working. So I think actually after 24 hours, I revealed that um, I revealed the next stretch goal, but I didn't I, I didn't have us unlock any other stretch goals up to that point. And I think that's where backers got kind of ag angry about it. They were like, okay, well, what's the point in me backing on this first day if my pledge doesn't, uh, doesn't actually support any stretch goals? Um, and so I ended up saying, okay, fine. We've unlocked all this stuff. We've already un unlocked all this stuff. And uh, and from now on, I'll, I'll say, okay, here are the remaining stretch goals. Here they all, here they are. Um, I think I revealed all of them. Maybe I only reveal revealed some of them. I think I revealed a bunch of them though. And we just kind of checked them off as we went from then on. What, what I can say, one of the major reasons I wanted to do this though, is that when you have a bunch of pre-planned or pre-announced stretch goals, you have no idea how you're going to fund on day one. And so you might have stretch goals planned through $500,000, say. And you're like, okay, it would be amazing if this project raised that much money over the course of 20 days. And then you reach $500,000 on day one. You then reveal all the stretch goals. And none of those stretch goals really get all that much attention. And they aren't exciting. You're out of stretch goals at that point. Um, so... I think maybe the way to go, the revised version of that is to reveal, is to list a few stretch goals. So list maybe three stretch goals um, at reasonable funding amounts for the first day. And then after they're reached, start to reveal more after that based on what you then know, what you know about that first day, that first 48 hours. Yeah. That's a, a long answer to uh, something that happened, what, back in 2015, seven years ago. So I, I think that's probably fairly accurate, but my memory might be a little fuzzy as well. Uh, Jay says the mango and dark chocolate ice cream from the Philippines. I think that's their, their either the ice cream recommendation or their indulgence of the day. I'll take it either way. Uh, Kevin says, curious to see if you do any VR gaming. Have you heard of the All On Board app that was recently kickstarted? It's a platform for board games in VR. Renegade, Ares Games, and AG will have games on the platform. What will you do something like that with your games? We're kind of waiting to see uh, what happens with those types of games. A lot of our digital rights are wrapped up with other companies. Um, and we work a lot with Tabletopia. I would love to just see Tabletopia versions uh, you know, in VR. Maybe that's already an option. I don't, I don't know. I haven't plugged into VR in like two years now. Megan does have an Oculus Quest 
And there was a while, especially early in the pandemic, where we were doing a lot of Beat Saber. We were doing something called Supernatural that might have changed its name after that. We were doing something called uh, Box VR, I think. It was like a boxing thing that was kind of like Beat Saber. Uh, and that was pretty much it. Uh, it. I haven't... It's something that I might return to from time to time, but it isn't something that I get all that excited about, about trying. Um, I don't play many video games in general, really. But I do think VR is really cool, but... Um, the Room. Okay, Megan has also done The Room. She enjoyed The Room in VR. I'm, I, yeah, and well, actually one other thing too is that for a while we were, we were able to sync the VR to our TV and then that stopped working. And so it became less uh, exciting for me to kind of like watch Megan play a game because I had to watch it on my phone instead of project it onto our TV screen. Chad says, have, have I recently come across any new feeling mechanisms or great takes on existing mechanisms? The Guild of Merchant Explorers, I think, definitely has a great take on... It's just a little twist on the type of game where you reveal something and all players do that, that thing. Uh, I know that's very vague. The, an example of, of that would be, would be in My City. So in My City, you reveal a card, and that card specifies the type of tile that both players must place in their city. Um, I like that style of game. I, it's simultaneous. I really like how that flows. The, the twist that the Guild of Merchant, Merchant Explorers does is that at certain points, one of those cards has... A Roman numeral on it, and that corresponds with an asymmetric ability that you get. You when that first card, when that card is first revealed, you get the asymmetric ability, and then from every round from then on, whenever that card is revealed, you trigger your own asymmetric ability, and they feel very good and very powerful. And so you have the simultaneous game happening, but you also where all players are essentially doing the same thing in different ways, but you also have a little bit of asymmetry in there. I think that was a great twist to that format of games. Um, as for new feeling mechanisms, mechanisms that feel completely new, I mean, we played a game called Sink or Swim the other day with uh, with Megan's family. It's a synchronized swimming cooperative game, and you know it did. It felt a little bit like the crew, um, but also felt a little bit different. I'm not describing it very well here, but it's a it's a game where you were trying to accomplish specific goals by cards you are playing face down in front of you in certain places to create a synchronized swimming routine. So I guess mostly it was thematically the game felt very different, even though it didn't really felt feel like uh, we were synchronized swimming, maybe just a little bit. But uh, that was a game that felt uh, felt refreshing at least in terms of the theme to uh, to give it a try. Definitely not new mechanically all that much. Um, but yeah, interesting to play at least. Interesting to try. Gerald says, uh, Gerald also uh, recommends Money Heist here. A lot of people brought up uh, Money Heist today. A lot of people are loving money, money Heist. Maybe I'll talk to Megan about giving Money Heist another try. I'll see what she thinks about it. Megan says she likes it. Okay, so maybe we'll we'll start at whatever season Megan left left off if she hasn't watched the whole thing. Okay, Nick clarifies what he's, what he's looking for for Red... Uh, uh, scythe version of Red Rising. He says, something involving a map, miniatures or sculpts, engine building, action selection, a larger plane, higher complexity type game. I can even imagine a scythe reskin with Red Rising theme. I don't think we do a reskin. Um, although people love scythe. I mean, maybe we should maybe we should consider that scythe in space, essentially, with, with Red Rising. Uh, I, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. Uh, I, I do want to keep continue to capture some feel of the society. And that's that was the trick in the original Red Rising game, that there are there's so many different types of people in the world, specific characters and, you know, the the, the, the pinks and the greens and the and the blues, all these interesting different colors and what they what they what roles they play in the society. Um, so I do want to keep that somehow. One thing I have thought about over the years is there's a game called Gugong that uh, that I recommend if you like Red Rising. It's kind of like a more complex version of Red Rising in terms of the, the hand management a little bit, where you your, your final hand doesn't matter in Gugong at the end of the game, but it does matter at the end of the round a little bit. Uh, but in Gugong, you are playing a card to the table and uh, and also picking up a card. And so that, but Gugong is a much more complex game than Red Rising. And so I've played around with a little bit the idea of making that a more complex version of Red Rising, where we kind of keep this core mechanism but build upon it quite a bit with with a with a sequel, maybe even in a way that we can use the original cards from Red Rising in the sequel, which I think would be really really cool. So Gugong is kind of the construct that I have in my head for something that we might try if we want to try it, but we'll see. Um, also need to keep an eye on how popular the Red Rising IP continues to be. 
Um, we don't know about that. We also need to see if uh, we could get the rights for a sequel. I don't even know if we have the rights for that. Uh, getting the rights for a di even a digital version has been almost impossible. So, yeah, we'll see about that. Let's see. Um, Kevin says that he really enjoyed The Room. Molly is just popping in here today. Susanna is just popping in here today. And Beverly, a lot of people are popping in late, and that's okay. Uh, I'm happy to cover anything that we've already covered. Some of the topics that I talked about today are heist games and movies, which was my video this past weekend. A lot of people are recommending that I give Money Heist another try. Um, blog post recently, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I did a video about uh, any patterns that emerged from the top five most viewed videos from the past year. did a blog post about that on Monday. And last Thursday, I talked about having lunch as a staff virtually and how that has brought me a lot of joy and hopefully has brought my coworkers some joy as well, has connected us a little bit better than, than, uh, than not having virtual lunches. Um, I mentioned next Wednesday is when we'll have our, when we'll, we'll officially kind of start our big 10th anniversary celebration. However, on Tabletopia, Toby, I think as of today, um, you can play our games in, as uh, one or two player modes of our games for free for the next month. You want to check out some of how games our games play on Tabletopia. Uh, I tried 23andMe recently. I was talking about that a little bit. Really enjoying games like Rumble Nation, Jekyll vs. Hyde, uh, The Guild of Merchant Explorers. And I'm excited about Disc Golf, the Disc Golf Worlds tournament that's happening right now. Loving following that. St. Louis Science Center is hosting a gaming related event where some of our games will have a presence through some volunteers this Friday, starting at five o'clock. Oh, and I didn't even mention, Megan's parents were here for a brief visit last week. Uh, we ate a lot of good food. We played some games with them, including the sink or swim game and a blockbuster themed game, which I wasn't expecting, but I had fun with that as a, as a movie trivia themed game. And we played some disc golf with them as well. Uh, had a lot of fun. Just a short little visit, but it was great to see them and see them here in St. Louis. And I think that's it for the topics I covered today. I need to look into the show called Hustle, a show called Press, and a show called Money Heist. I have all TV show recommendations here today that I need to check out. So yeah, thank you for those recommendations. Again, I have a tease that you can see elsewhere on the Stonemaier Games Facebook page or on Instagram if you're not on Facebook or the Stonemaier Games Discord. You can see the tease there. It's a teaser image of stuff that I'll be talking about next week, um, maybe even a little bit before Wednesday. Uh, we'll start selling them on Wednesday, but I think some of our champions will learn about what those things are on Monday. And then uh, you might start to see our website update a little bit on Monday or Tuesday, I think, as we reveal those things. We'll see how exactly it plays out. Uh, let's see. Oh, Nathan says, what's your shirt today? My shirt actually involves a spoiler. I, did, I was a little hesitant to wear it, but it's been a while since we've spoiled this thing. I don't want to say it. It is, but it is a Stonemaier game related thing that is not a spoiler for many people. Um, many people, I think, already know what this is. But I don't. Wanna, if you don't know what it is yet, I don't want to spoil it for you, Nathan. But it is a spoiler for a thing that has happened in a Stonemaier game. Oh, Beth Beverly says that she learned at disc golf in Lee's Summit, Missouri. I'll have to check out that course someday, Beverly, if it isn't too far from St. Louis. That's great. All right, I'm going to sign off and go get some lunch, but thank you so much for joining me today. I'll be back um, next Wednesday for, for all the big stuff. This will be a, a big one next Wednesday. I look forward to seeing you then. Oh, and Tony recommended The Bear. I Oh, a few show recommendations. Sherry, I do love For All Mankind. We're, we're just, we haven't watched the latest season yet, but I do love that show. And Tony recommended The Bear, which we did watch a few weeks ago and, and did enjoy it. Intense. Intense show about working in a restaurant, but I did enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a great Wednesday. I will see you later. Bye.